Welcome to SelfDiscoveryMedia.com, where we discover the communities that are making a difference in the lives of others. Our self-discovery is something we are all making on our life's journey. Here you will find the people that will be your guidance, that will be your inspiration, that will be there for you in support on your journey of life. Do enjoy. Our next show is... Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Their Story Matters right here at selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and my guest is Chef Andrew Grohl. He's doing something absolutely marvelous right now. Um, he has had his fame, you know, with the Food Network's food truck face-off. He's been a judge on that. He's a wonderful chef of Slapfish, a seafood restaurant franchise based in Huntington Beach, California. But he's doing something fantastic right now, which is helping struggling out of work restaurant workers restaurants um, that are in the US that had just been devastated by what is happening at the present moment it's all very well anybody saying go and get a job but if there aren't any jobs to have um, what do they do and I have a I've been brought up in the restaurant business. My children have all been in it. My son has it. And I know what a struggle it is, even on the day to day when things are good, uh, never mind when things are bad. And the fact that you're raising this awareness and, and raising these funds to help these people out is absolutely fantastic. And I love how people who have reached a wonderful goal um, pay it forward. So first and foremost, thank you very much for paying it forward, Andrew. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the intro and thanks for having me. Restaurant business is a tough business. You know, a chef doesn't go into it normally for fame or fortune or money, right? You have to really reach the pivotal top for that. It is something that is a passion, you know, for a chef or restaurateur to open up. Um, I know with, with my son, his restaurant, if people go away with a happy tummy and a smile on the face, that's worth everything. And uh, so it is that appreciation of that food. And we sometimes take it for granted when we go out to eat, all the love, the passion, the commitment, and even the struggles that go behind in putting that food in front of someone. But right now, it's really, really topsy-turvy, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And obviously, you have an understanding of the industry. You know, mm. it, it's, it's pretty funny because the context of us chatting right now, I was going back and forth on some social media sites and I came, I got sucked into a wormhole <laughs> on the restaurant industry and it was a debate over working, living wages, et cetera. And the resounding message from a lot of people in the comments section was, well, these restaurant owners are so greedy. I mean, can't they just share some of this money, these multimillionaires? And I realized at that moment that people don't understand what goes into the restaurant industry and that it is not a, it, I joke, I always say, I'm not in the restaurant industry, I'm in a nonprofit industry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yet, so many restaurateurs still give so much away, you know, because it is that heart passion, you know, you, it's long hours, it can be grueling. You're in a sweaty kitchen, uh, or the servers are on their feet for hours upon hours carrying heavy trays of food. Um, you do it because you love the response or you love what you're doing, it's that commitment and that passion but there are many other careers out there that are going to pay better. So again, I think if people could eat with appreciation, yeah. a little more gratitude, they would actually probably enjoy the food even more. Yeah, and that's a good point. And I think that that, that, that idea also just applies to the actual food that's on the plate. Um, mm. I talk a lot about sustainability and you know, a local food system. And I think, you know, eating with gratitude is important because every single thing we put on our plate came from somewhere. Yes. I, I posted a stat the other day. I mean, the amount of waste, 40% of the of waste in the food system that's just thrown away could feed everybody the hunger, mm -hmm. you know, hungry people in the world eight times over. Um, I know that France and a couple of other countries banned waste, that all the food at the end of the day had to go to the various societies that would feed people. And I don't know why that isn't a law everywhere. I know what's happened is the lawyers have stepped in. Oh, what if somebody sues us because they get food poisoning? Well, what if they starve to death because nobody's given them a meal today? You know, it's let's get sensible. But have you found sensibility hasn't really been kind of part of the equation <laughs> yeah that's and, and that's another good topic you bring up i mean i you know I, I i i was walking behind a local grocery store the other day and there was five shopping carts full of lettuces and all these various types of produce 
And I asked somebody who worked there, I said, what is this? And they said, oh, it's just, you know, past expiration, et cetera, needs to get thrown away. They were throwing it all away. I took a picture of it, to, not to shame anyone, right? And I didn't name the grocery store. And I, I said, this illustrates just the need for systems. And the everybody was responding. They said, look, it's all about lawsuits. You yes. technically can give it away, but there's the, the lawsuit element corporations don't want to be put in that type of a situation. I mean, there needs to be some sort of immunity yeah. that even protects against, because there was certain bills that were passed, but there's these negligence loopholes in there, right? Just blanket immunity. We can't blanket anything. We have to look at each, you know, um, each story as, as its own tale. And, you know, America, and I know many other countries right now, have got even more people hungry because, you know, they're just not getting, um, subsidy, they're losing their jobs or they're sick and they can't work. Um, my own daughter's in the industry and she got COVID and she was being extremely careful, being tested all the time. She's dating a teacher and he got it from his students, young students. I'm talking kindergartners. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know when you're going to get something like this. And of course, it's completely flattened her, not only health wise, but, you know, also in going back to work. Will she have the energy to kind of keep up with the the heavy duty system of working in a restaurant because it is foot to the pedal the whole time, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. No, it is. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. We actually avoided having with multiple restaurants the way in which we, uh, well, we attempted to avoid, and I think it worked because we haven't had a spread of cases internally, but we told everybody from the very beginning, you have unlimited paid time off. Um, yeah. Right. So if you, cross paths with somebody who cross paths with somebody who cross paths with somebody don't come to work right? right be very aware of your surroundings and get tested we'll cover the cost of testing and take the days off two days three days it's not worth it right um and did we have some people take advantage of that yeah yes but they were bad seeds anyway and they ended up quitting for other reasons right. by and large the majority of people did they called they said hey i'm going to use that because i feel a little tickle in my throat i was fine the past few days i'm going to avoid coming into work we had a gentleman last week, similar situation. He goes, I feel fine. My roommate had a tickle in her throat. Mm -hmm. Turns out she had COVID, um, or, you know, and I'm just not going to come in. I'm going to keep getting tested. Fine, no problem. We'll keep paying you. Do not come in. Now, if we weren't paying somebody yeah. to stay home, I'm afraid he would have just pushed the limits, tested his luck for the money and come in. And it turns out he ended up getting, co he, he did have it. Yeah, well, if you've got a roommate there, then, you know, that definitely does yeah. happen. The, yeah. the other thing I'm mind boggling and is why does anybody have to pay to be tested? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the other thing too. It's because, you know, you're not encouraging case. people to go and get tested. Um, yeah, yeah. I said from the very beginning, I said we should have you, every single business yeah. just have home test kits. Yes. You know, all of these things we did, we bought, my wife and I, we bought a test kit from a doctor's. I don't remember how she even got her hands on it. And um, it's been helpful because we've had situations at home where it's like, oh, let's just test ourselves. And there's a sense of, you know, you get, there's obviously a sense of comfort. They're pretty good tests too, but everyone should have them. Yeah, I agree. Um, as far as I'm concerned with the pandemic, um, getting the vaccine, being tested and supporting people who are sick should be utterly and completely covered. Mm -hmm. There should be no profiteering at all in any of this. You want your workforce to get back to work. You want people to get back to their lives. You want people to be healthy because if they're not healthy, they're not productive. So if you're wanting to get taxes from people's income, then get them working by keeping them healthy. And I just feel sometimes it's just kind of the wrong way round. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been very, very lucky here. I'm in Victoria, BC um, in Canada, and we've been very, very lucky that um, we had the complete shutdown in the beginning. And uh, um, I talk about my son with his restaurant. He had just had an operation and snapping his Achilles. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, he's been interviewed by the news with his leg in a plaster. <laughs> you know? And he's on the phone taking orders because all they could do is take out with his leg in a plaster. Um, but as he said, this time we had another lockdown recently. And he said, this time I'm ready for it. And as I said, he, he created specialty meals like Easter dinners and, and Christmas dinners or celebration dinners or, you know, it's Sunday, you don't want to cook. And that has literally kept him alive. It, one has to, in the restaurant business, pivot and be creative, don't you, in order to survive? 
Yeah, of course, of course. And that's what we do. And that's what we do best. Um, and it's, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of nuance to this and it's important at every turn, of course, that we as restaurateurs are thinking about mm -hmm. what the next potential, I think this has really opened our eyes to needing to get ahead of certain things, yes. right? On a micro level and not a macro level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have numerous restaurants and, um, I know so many people who have had chain restaurants have had to close or even temporary close. I don't know what kind of support you've had in America as far as kind of, you know, the rent on the properties and this and that, because, you know, uh, Canada has tried to subsidize businesses to keep their doors open as best as they can. Um, it's, you know, you want to keep people employed and you want to keep giving food to people. Um, but, you know, as a restauranter, how stressful has it been for you to try and keep all these balls up in the air? Yeah, it's been incredibly stressful. Um, and there's certain programs, public programs here, whereby you can gain relief and rebates and redemptions, et cetera. But the costs of increasing the safety of your business are not being covered in any of these programs. Now they're starting to, and I think that's been the piece that's been frustrating. Um, and it's a, it's a competition on a state by state basis. Some, some states have strict measures, some states don't. And then, you know, they're comparing numbers and they're all trying to kind of outdo each other. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of division, unfortunately. Um, uh, you know, we've just tried to kind of bury ourselves into the reality of operations. Mm -hmm. Now you're raising this fund and, and awareness for, you know, for the workers, it's the same as with the, you know, with the movie industry and with the theater industry you know um it's just there is no work they they can't work it's been a year that the theater industry has been shut down um and it, ei or iu whatever it's called only covers so much uh raising this fund and awareness for you know for out of work um employees how did that come about was it just something you saw in your own industry you know in your own business that there needs to be some help here yeah, well, what ended up happening was during the round of the first shutdowns, they got all of this federal money, which is was for unemployment benefits. And a lot of states ended up misappropriating the funds because it was kind of there was so much money that needed to go out that obviously these government systems don't necessarily have enough control measures in place. So money was going out to in some states, it was really bad. So here in California, it was like. $40 billion and for the second lockdown, which occurred in November, December, and all these people who thought they were going to be able to have jobs because outdoor dining was open. See, they closed outdoor dining as well. And mm -hmm. these people had set up structures and all of these creative avenues by which they could continue serving. People lost their jobs. Restaurants started to close. But then you go back to the unemployment and they were not they were not distributing the funds because of the gridlock from the fraud. Right. Mm -hmm. So this was going into the holidays. People lost their jobs and there was no money for anybody. And people had to make decisions. I can't pay rent. I can't pay utilities. I can't put food on the table, let alone buy Christmas gifts for the kids. Right. And that was when we tried to step forward and say, look, we're going to set up this fund for struggling and out of work restaurant workers. Um, and that's going to be the answer. Yeah. Um, sorry, this picture always comes up. <laughs> I, I like know that. Wishful yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, thinking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's always about that. You know, it just this too will pass. The wind will blow it away, right? And the ocean will will wash the shores. Is that whatever's happening at the present moment? We have to keep reminding ourselves it is temporary. It's not forever. And it's like in any time of crisis, whether it's war, whether it's a pandemic, what um, economic turn down, it is weathering the storm. And knowing that this too will pass. But if we don't take care of the people in the meantime, it may pass, but who's around to benefit? Mm -hmm. So it's short sighted not to support the people that you're going to need later. Sure. Um, I, I just, I really kind of sometimes look at if maybe common sense is missing in governments. <laughs> so uh, you own a lot of restaurants, and of course, your seafood is your thing, which I love seafood. I do. I, I'm trying to be vegan, but I can't when it comes to seafood. You're in a great um, area when it comes to seafood. Oh, gosh. Yes, yes, yes. Our salmon. Mm, delicious. Um, and in, it's not just the restaurant workers. It's all the suppliers. It's all the farmers. It's all the fishermen. I mean, if there's no restaurants open, who's going to take their goods? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so now you have that surplus. What happens to that surplus? 
do they just throw it away? Well, what about the people that are hungry? Is there a system to give it to hungry organizations and subsidize the, you know, the farmers and the fishermen and everything else? This, is, this isn't just on the top surface, is it? It's a trickle down. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it brings up a lot of questions about the food systems in general. Um, we've consolidated our food systems corporately and through government, you know, mechanisms. And I think that what that's done is, is that that's put us in situations where when we run into pandemics or emergencies just like this is just that we don't because it's so massive because it's so consolidated we don't have the ability to to immediately stop things to slow things down it's the loc it's the locomotive right that yeah. you just you can't stop it like you can a bicycle yes. um, it takes so much time and as you're trying to stop it you're losing product you're wasting product and we saw that in the beginning of the pandemic and now on the flip side as things are opening back up again here in the U.S., now we're running into supply shortages because yeah. now we're trying to restart that locomotive and it takes so much time to get it up to speed. Um, whereas I use this always as an opportunity to talk about local food systems. If mm. we were growing and developing locally, it would be much easier to have creative solutions to this because we can start and stop on a smaller scale. Yeah, I, I do believe very much um, local. Again, my, my son's restaurant, he uses entirely local all in his area because there's plenty of farmers and everything and he drives by as local as possible and that supports your community and that's really what we need to do we need to kind of get back to a village mentality where you know we support one another the village is only as strong as everybody's participation in it and if somebody's having a hard time the village helps them and vice versa and if you have that kind of community it's so much easier to help each other through but when it's so kind of widespread or corporated you know, you kind of lose that connection, don't you? And there, there feels like there's no camaraderie or control anywhere. Yeah, of course. And then it's just this kind of, uh, you know, non-personified entity and, and it's just very impersonal. Food trucks is also your passion. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot more food trucks pop up because people can go and buy food and take it home. Have you found that industry has survived better during this time period? Yes, no, we've seen a lot of the food truck industry has, has been, you know, shuttered here in the States in the beginning when they couldn't serve because you still couldn't even serve off of a food truck, right? Because you, there was too much face-to-face -face interaction and a lot of food truck owners are just small independent owner operators. So they were crushed. We helped a lot of food trucks out through the fund because they were not just owners, but they were also employees. And while we were focusing on the, the employees, we were also focusing on employee run businesses. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen quite a number of, you know, small kind of either food trucks or small local locations. And we didn't, we, we had takeout, you could do takeout. They didn't shut that down here, but of course mask up, right? Nobody would be served without the mask and everything else because people have still got to eat. And you know, there are some people that simply do not cook. All they do is eat out. So it makes it a lot harder. How does this money that you're raising get distributed and to whom? Well, and it's changed, right? So in the beginning, when it was when the unemployment system was broken, we were distributing it immediately within, you know, minutes of getting it, it felt like. And it was just my wife and myself and my family. So we were bringing in the donations and then we were going through the applications, thousands of applications, vetting the application because there's always a few bad apples in there yes. where they're trying to scam you. And then we were determining how much we could distribute because we were still bringing in limited funds when it came to the amount of applications, right? Higher demand than there is mm -hmm. supply. So eventually we would choose who we were giving the money to. And then we were trying to distribute the money virtually through Zelle, bank apps, all of that, but we had limits on there. So it got to the point where it was myself, my wife, and my four kids driving around Southern California, handing checks out, paying <laughs> landlords, paying people's utilities. Um, and now that unemployment has caught up, and people are getting it now we're trying to help some more businesses mm -hmm. um, than we are team members or businesses who want to use the money to pay their employees some employees are still on hold when it comes to the unemployment system but they started to shut down restaurants here again recently in oregon and washington so well, all the funds we're raising right now we're distributing over into that area so no matter you know where you know the funds coming in it's going to go where it's most needed mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, that, I mean, the, as you pointed out earlier, the cost of, you know, in, in a restaurant, putting up the screens and all the masks and all the, the cleansingness and everything else. I mean, that all costs money. And a lot of restaurants, have, it's been a big expense for them to go in and put all this plexiglass and everything else. Was there any subsidy for that? Or is that something that had to come out of their own pocket? That's something that's had to come out of everybody's own pocket. Yeah, there has not been subsidies for that. And they've set up some hyper-local grant programs, et cetera, where if the money is used for that. But most of those programs are just so new and they're, they're difficult to execute. So I know people, hundreds of people who have applied for those grants and they haven't been able to get them. Yeah. Um, you often wonder, you know, why all of these particular programs, um, you know, government programs are put in place if, if they just cannot serve. Um, and I interview an awful lot of veterans and one of the reasons they do is not the glorification of the war, but of what they do for each other because they realize they weren't getting the help that they needed from the governments, but and they were the only ones that could truly understand how to help each other. So. And they set up all sorts of programs that have done that. Are you finding that other restaurateurs are you know, wanting to work with you, that this has kind of become a conglomerate now of other restaurateurs supporting each other? Yeah, there's certainly industry, you know, business to business support um, and community support, as you even mentioned with your son's mm -hmm. restaurant, the local community. Yeah. I think the unfortunate piece of it here in the States though, is, is that there's been this big conversation about restaurants being super spreader uh, arenas mm -hmm. or environments and that, frankly, isn't necessarily the case. No. Um, restaurants, we are trained inherently to create safe and sanitary environments. So we were kind of prepped for this, right? Okay, here's the new protocol. We've already got the sanitation procedures in place. Let's just do this, do this. But even more important is, is the element of accountability, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you go out, you don't, you don't wear your pajamas out in public, right? Because there's this level of public accountability. You get yeah. dressed up, you know, you wear your mask, you do all of these things. When you're in your own home, you're not doing that. And if you're having a house party, meeting with yeah. the neighbors, et cetera, you might not be as accountable to wear masks, to socially distance as you would be if you were in a restaurant that was following the protocols. So that's why I say that the restaurant industry can be used as a model or a vehicle through which you can model really good behavior. By shutting us down, I think some of the unintended consequences were that we saw a spike in cases because it was all now happening in people's yes. backyards. I completely agree with you. You know, we've had that same problem where um, everybody is allowed to have patio dining. Yeah. And so everybody's, you know, they've, they've taken up the parking spots and put out patio things and shelters and big umbrellas and everything else. So because that's the only way they can stay alive along with takeout. Um, but as they've pointed out, when we had our recent shutdown for inside rest dining, it's like, but we have all the protocol in place, all the screens are up, all the testing people have to, you know, do the hand sanitation when they come in, uh, even go to the bathroom, the mask has to be back on, everything. And it's like, why are you penalizing the one industry that's already got it right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, th and that's been the unfortunate nature. And I think the effect of that, the long-term effect, which could be more subliminal, is the, is, the, is the psychology, the consumer psychology. So will we as consumers now start to think, ooh, restaurants, risky, maybe I shouldn't go out, right? And then we end up, you know, kind of diverting our dollars into these third-party delivery apps, which are not great for the restaurants because they, at least here in the States, they, they take you. of the dollar. Yeah. Is it um, skip the dishes that was like 30%? Yeah, well, all of them here, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub, Postmates, they're all 30, 30 cents on a dollar, 30%. And you you're doing, you're... You then have to put your prices up on your food and that makes it harder for the people that are buying it. You know, um, it's just like, OK, there's always going to be people that will be profiteers in times of crisis. But I think there also has to be accountability. I know they actually did here put a cap on it and saying you cannot charge that much. I think they said 15 percent or something because it was just ridiculous of how high yeah. it was. They did um, that, too. In, in certain cities here, they put caps on it. But once again, unintended consequences you know what ended up happening was that when they weren't because they put a cap on it the delivery app stopped doing in-app advertising right and instead what that did was that buried the small independent restaurants and the name well-known name brands like your mcdonald's etc yeah gained and garnered more sales through the apps than the independents would have and so it ended up hurting the small independent restaurants even though the intention was good such an interesting kind of mix of, of 
cause and effect. When my um, ex-husband and I owned a restaurant way back when, 30 something years ago, um, we did deliveries, um, but you know, we, we did the deliveries. There was no you know, other association. And again, my son has gone into um, him doing the deliveries. Like he has one driver that when he's not driving, he's, he's washing dishes, he's doing that, he's doing whatever a, a delivery comes up, he goes and delivers because he said, I simply can't afford. Plus the fact they weren't in his area. They hadn't kind of reached his area there. But it's like, I, he said, I'd rather employ somebody and give them that 30% mm -hmm. than, than the other. So have you found that some restaurants have gone into, forget about skip the dishes or anything, that we will do direct delivery ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. And we're even going to try and implement it through our stores. I think that it's, that's a good thing, right? Because mm -hmm. now you're, 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 you're re-employing people yes. uh, that don't necessarily want to work with some of the third-party delivery apps. Because frankly... They're very corporate and they're, they're not great to their employees. They're contract workers. So um, it could be a good thing. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, we, we always have to see the bad and from the bad, we have to see what good can come from it. Yeah. You know, and that's always an important thing to do. So it, it's, um, you know, you look at a system and you go, okay, the principle of it is good, but the application of it isn't. So what can I do to change it? And that's, but it, 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 the businesses that won't survive are those that haven't pivoted or, you know, try to think outside the box um, and uh, who are being creative. So a lot of your marum, um, you know, power type restaurants are really struggling because everything has gone to social media and online. And there's a lot of restaurants that have been around for a long time that aren't really online type uh, places. So um, do you find that they have completely and utterly been left behind? Yeah, yeah, I think that this has just sped it up, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and that that's a real that's a real, you know, frustrating piece of this. Um, that's why I talk about you know not destroying Main Street, right? Yes. We need that character, we need that charm, that culture that yes. every Main Street has in every city in every town. If there's something about walking down the street and there's you know a restaurant in every block, you know, of a different style. And you go, well, what yeah. do I feel like today? And you walk down the street, mm, I want that. And you go in there. Um, if they're not there, I mean, right now, you know, where we are in Victoria, you can go down a few blocks and for lease, for lease, for lease. And, uh, you know, and it's such a shame to see some big names that have gone, that have completely and utterly closed up. Yeah. Um, if we could support our local uh, people as you know as a community and say, okay, all right, we can't come and dine in, do a takeout, we will come and pick it up. If you can't do delivery, it's up to us too, isn't it, as a community to get out there and support those people that are struggling? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like the age old cliche. If everybody does a little bit, then one person doesn't have to do a lot, right? Yeah. Um, we all do our part. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to say how long we're going to be doing this. I know that an awful lot of people have been vaccinated in the States. You know, it really seems to be gathering good momentum right now. I know you do have a huge population who still believes that it's a, a micro trip from Microsoft in the vaccine and a few other things. Um, but are you going to go the way where employees need to be vaccinated to work? Um, you know, we haven't even, to be honest with you, we haven't even considered or thought about that. Um, we've just been trying to kind of keep up with the daily operations and not necessarily thinking about it. I mean, we've had a lot of employees who have gone and have gotten vaccinated. We pay everybody for their time to go and do so. Um, you know, we try and make it e as easy as possible, but, but, you know, I just, I don't even think it'll come to that um, where we'll need to do, where we'll need to instill a policy like that. You think people will choose for themselves? Yeah. 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 And I, I think that, um, you know, I have faith in, I have faith in, in kind of the system and things just really shaking itself out. A lot of people in the restaurant business and including my daughter, you know, works hard for all the kind of the summer months so that she can go traveling through the winter months. So you have a lot of seasonal staff mm -hmm. and that's sometimes in, especially in this kind of crisis could be detriment because they're not, you know, kind of nine to fivers or they're not you know, 12 months of the year. Have you found those people it's been even harder for them? because they're not on that regimented timetable. Yeah, yeah, I mean it has certainly, you know, changed everybody's schedule if you mm -hmm. will and and um, that's a really good point. Yeah, that it's especially specific for us in some of our um, more coastal communities. Yeah. Yes. Um, we're going into summer and the hope is really looking a lot better and of course I know America is beginning to open up a lot more. 
um, we're certainly going to be encouraging a lot more dining and obviously everybody you know I don't know about uh, your clientele but everybody here the moment the the sun is out even if it's not sunny as long as we haven't got howling gales and sleet we sit outside yeah. <laughs> you know? so um, I mean it's more and more we're going to be doing that because people are starving not only for good food but for that wonderful camaraderie of around the table good food good wine and good company it's so hard to beat that isn't it yeah definitely that's what people need they need that connection that yeah. human connection i mean it's been especially difficult on everybody including kids yes yeah i think kind of you know i predict the next pandemic will be post-traumatic stress from the pandemic Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have to be there to support one another on, on a much bigger level. And that means, you know, reaching out, going out for a meal with someone, having a good old bitch fest if you need that to get it off your chest, you know, having that that hug and that good food to warm your tummy up. And uh, and just we're not going to go back to normal because normal was dysfunctional anyway. But we do want to get back to some consistency mm -hmm. where we can connect, which is really important. There is something about dining with friends or family isn't there i mean it's, it's the beginning of time sitting around the table you know uh, telling stories eating food having laughter it's the it's all very well getting the food and taking it home especially if you're on your own but the ingredient is sharing you know sharing with you're not sharing your food sharing your stories it's and it's a missing ingredient of what we're having right now with not being able to sit at a table and eat certainly food is the great unifier Oh, oh God, is it? Yes. And, you know, the, the diversity of food. Um, I know that seafood is your is your main thing, but do you have um, different types of seafood restaurants or are they, are they all the same? Or... Yeah, we have we, we have a full service and fast casual, but I also do have a pizza restaurant, a chicken restaurant as well. And we did have a vegan restaurant. It was plant based, 100 percent plant based. It was called Butterleaf. So mm -hmm. I, I fashioned it as vegetarian for meat eaters. Right. The joke right. Is that you won't even notice there's no meat. Right. And uh, and we had to shut that down in the pandemic. Oh, I do hope that you can rectify that again, because veganism is most certainly on the rise. Um, my other daughter and her husband are 100 percent vegan and people just think it's a lettuce leaf. And it isn't. There are so many absolutely wonderful, delicious meals you can have. And the subsidy of, of meat or fish or anything today is just so sophisticated, isn't it? Yeah. So there are many people who have eaten meat based, you know, plant based food, thinking it's still meat, even the fish. So, yeah, if um, I hope you're going to open that, that one up again, <laughs> promote veganism. Um, talking about veganism, actually, have you actually f uh, observed uh, its increase, you know, in in America? Yeah. yeah, a little bit. I wouldn't say full vegan. Um, but what we have seen is, is that people are more are eating more vegetables. Right. Yeah. So it's about a celebration of vegetables and legumes, you know, beans, yeah. rice, et cetera. So there's a lot of people who are recognizing, you know, the environmental benefits and, of course, the health benefits. So, you know, we naturally being a seafood restaurant, it's a lot more pescatarianism. And yeah. we're seeing that, um, you know, my my big, you know, mm, I don't want to say spiel, but my thing is, is that I, I do get worried about some of the synthetic forms because mm -hmm. I think the chemicals that go into that sometimes yeah. can be worse than the actual protein itself. Um, but when it comes to a celebration of vegetables, we're huge on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you predict for yourself coming up? You know, how do you, you feel? Are you feeling confident that the restaurants will all be back open, you know, come summer and people will be able to dine in as well as uh, the patio and, you know, I mean, obviously going back into the fall, we're going to have to be more cautious again because flu season, um, which we haven't seen much of because everybody's been wearing masks. And I think it's actually a good idea during flu season for people to again be masked up um, when they're amongst the crowd because um, it's just shown that we're not passing the flu on because we're masking up. But what do you see for, for your restaurants coming up in the next while? Um, you know, just... For us, it's about being creative. I think that there's a surplus right now of restaurants, unfortunately, based on the demand. So mm. I think we're going to still start to see the industry atrophy a little bit. And it's all about those restaurants that can kind of stand out in the crowd, maybe be a little bit forward thinking. Um, you know, I, I just for us, we're still in survival mode, right? Yeah. It's still about just week on week, making sure that our team members are able to continue working, getting hours, making sure that they're happy, making sure we've got a strong staff, good backbone the right products, getting the products in, mm. and then constantly trying to, you know, just kind of maintain 
so that we can get past this and get through it, as you say, weather the storm. Yeah, and you know when you when you think about the you know the fa um, the funding that you're doing, it doesn't need to stop just because restaurants are open because people yeah. have so much back pay. You know how many people's visas are up to the limit and what they're paying 20 percent on it you know and they're still going to be playing catch up for a long time mm -hmm. so just because restaurants are open oh they're open they don't need support anymore yes they do because they've had a whole year of yeah. this and, I, there's and the that's a great point you make i'm glad you bring that up because people don't think about it that mm. way it's not just the light switch right you're right mm -hmm. yeah yeah we so we started this fund and it's through a gofundme right and yep. it's called 86 struggle um, and it's the website's the number 86struggle.com. But I am filing for a 501c3 right now, which is tax, you know, your nonprofit tax exempt status because we want to be able to take on larger donations from corporations. Many of them, they won't donate unless it's tax, tax yeah. exempt. That's all they care about. And uh, <laughs> I, um, but the goal is, you know, uh, our tax attorney said, well, you really want to take the time and spend the money to develop this because the pandemic's over. I said, no, 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 no. We want to use this now as a vehicle by which we can continue to raise money to help those out in the industry. Pre-pandemic, it was difficult on so many yes. restaurant workers uh, for lack of insurance, right? You get into a car accident, you don't have the right insurance. And next thing you know, you know, the guy who's working three jobs, um, he got four kids at home, has a $50,000 medical bill. Oh. We want to have an organization where that those people can come to us and say, look, you know, this guy needs $45,000. We hear the story and then we help out because when you look at it on a federal level in the government, and obviously Canada is a little bit different than mm -hmm. the United States. We have that, health coverage here. Yeah. Yeah. We, well, we don't, right? Mm -hmm. So, so health insurance has become just such a political issue yeah. now that when things become so politicized, I give up on there being a resolution. Right. Be, because then it's like everyone's, no one's looking for common ground. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's like, well, we'll just take the matters into our own hands, right? Yes. Um, and think of it as more of like a health share. So that's that's what we're going to do with the fund. Will you invite other restaurateurs? I mean, you're you're on TV. You you know you've got the 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 network behind you and everything else. Will you invite them to come and be a part of this? I would hope so. Yeah, I would certainly hope so. I think that um, you know a lot of restaurateurs are afraid to speak out on these types of topics. Look, I mean, you know, I run the risk at every single day of getting canceled for saying something wrong. I'm going to tick somebody off, but we look at it as just the common good and all boats can rise with a high tide. One thing I have learned through the pandemic is that restaurant tours are scared. I have people reaching out to me left and right and they're like, thank you for speaking out on, on, on our behalf. We're afraid to do so because we're afraid that we're gonna get the ire of one particular group of people who don't like us. And I said, look, you just gotta be honest with yourself. Nobody's, you're never gonna please everybody. No. Um, as long as you're putting out a good product, you're ethical, you're moral, and you're um, looking at doing things for the good of the community and not just yourself. As I had mentioned to you, uh, you know, get it, get caught into a, a long string of comments and you, everybody thinks the restaurant tours are the bad guys, but yeah. I think the majority on, outside of the internet understand the truth. <laughs> well, you know, like I always say, the, the um, internet is an algorithm and it's going to feed what is put out or responded to. So the thing is don't respond to them because yeah. you know, they're just people that are, you know, on the misery train and anything they can do to cut and slice and dice people to make themselves feel good. So don't feed their algorithm, right? And I, I think like maybe, that. you know, social media folks get on there and you've had a good meal at a restaurant, get up there on social media and share where you ate, mm -hmm. right? Share the, the good meal you had and invite other people to go there. But, you know, we can be the promotion, the advertising for the restaurant industry that's so struggling. So, you know, um, I think it's even Google that has an app where it comes up and asks you questions about where you've been. You know, does this restaurant have this? Does it have that? Did you have a good meal and all of that? Respond to them because this is how we can support. Never mind going out and eating out, but let everybody know we ate out, we had a great meal, come on down. So we could do our bit as well. Yep, that's a great, that is a great, a great, a great bit of advice. How much of, um, um, of social media have you had to use in order to actually promote your business and, and let people know what's going on? Oh, that, that's the name of the game. Mm -hmm. it's, really, it's like 95% of our marketing budget. And that money is we give food away, right? Mm -hmm. So my idea, my thought is I'm not going to put $5,000, $2,000 into an advertisement right. where I don't know what the return on the investment is. Yeah. I'd rather give food away, yes. write that off as a marketing expense because 
The only way they're going to know if we have a good product is to try the product. And the only way to get them to try the product just give it to them. <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. uh, but also if people know that, you know, you are giving it that somebody is getting a meal that wouldn't have a meal. I well, mean, I, yep, yep. there was one state where they were, they arrested a 92 year old for giving food to the homeless, and it's like I beg your pardon. I saw. You know what what kind of society are you running there? You know, it's unbelievable. And I think uh, one of the big things that we need to inject back into everything is humanity you know, is compassion, is mm -hmm. consideration um, and gratitude. Because again, that food on your plate that you're complaining has gone up in price. Think about how much they've had to pay to keep the restaurant open, mm -hmm. how much they've had to subsidize staff, whether they're working or not, how much food costs have gone up, delivery costs have gone up of those food products, the taxation that goes up on everything. And just think every time you're eating that meal, eat it with gratitude and appreciation and stick quibbling the fact that it's gone up a bit. That's just yeah. the cost of it. Budget yourself. Okay. I can only eat out twice a month or once a week and, uh, and but go out and have that fun, support the restaurants and um, don't quibble about it. Yeah. And don't forget to tip. I, I agree a hundred percent. You know, that's another thing. Oh, if, if restaurants paid their staff more, we wouldn't have to tip. But it doesn't work that way, does it? I mean, a lot of people don't understand the tipping system. Well, it's, it incentivizes as yes. well, right? Like we, our team members want the tips. You know, if, if they want to know that they could come to work today and they could get $300 tip, right? I mean, it's, it's a little bit of the gamble. That's right. the excitement. You know, that's the way that we live life. Right. Uh, and it's an incentive. It exactly. It's yeah. exactly it. Now we give a, we, you know, we pay a 50 to 60% above minimum wage base anyway, but the tips are, you know, the tips are an opportunity for other people to reward. It's a tax-free gift. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not tax-free, but right, I always yeah. joke, I say, this tip I'm giving you is as a tax-free gift. <laughs> yeah. yeah my, my son has all the tips for that particular shift is pooled. And then it goes out according to the people that are working there and always goes back to the kitchen as well. Yes, and we do that as well. And that, but you know, that was illegal here in the states uh, up until recently. They overturned. Really? Yeah, yeah. Tip pooling was illegal. Oh, really? In certain states. Um, mm. Yeah, but here in California, it was. Yeah, um, you know, and I know those tips make a huge difference. You know, to uh, you know the cost of living or that little extra thing they want to do or that concert they want to go to. Um, yeah. You know, or just you know, we we want people to kind of get back and be productive and and as things open up we want them to be able to afford it because then they're now supporting other industries and uh -huh. the, and then you know when people go to a concert they're going to eat before or eat after right or a theater or a movie and you know this is this is the thing is the more we support others the more they support the industry and that lovely cycle carries on uh -huh. support 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 folks <laughs> yep it is, it's a, it's a, it's an integrated system yeah Definitely. Are you still um, being a judge on the truck drivers right now? Is that on hiatus or what is no, happening? That was, that was actually years ago. And it was funny. It was, it, well, the, I haven't done television the, uh, with Food Network for a little over a year. Um, we've been producing some of our own stuff, um, which we'll be launching here soon. But the, when I did Food Truck Face Off, actually, we shot that. That was Food Network Canada and Food Network US. So we did all the studio work in Canada. We did all the sh uh, street work in the United States. It was a... Um, uh, coordinated production so yeah you can get some great grub from truck um restaurants can't you you can you can there's some great ones there's also some uh questionable ones yes so, yes you know, it was up to us to find the right one right exactly and of course you know getting that kind of recognition on tv i mean it's you know you can't buy that kind of advertising can you exactly earned media all the way so you're doing something yourself now does that mean you're going to be putting something out yeah, we're going to launch some of our own cooking stuff. Myself, my wife, my kids, we've been kind of working together on it, um, you know, with some production to to try and develop our own digital 
digital show. Well, but this is what a lot of people have actually done um, through the pandemic has been done Zoom cooking shows, you know, yeah. people cooking up a meal and some ideas. And of course, with people being locked down, yeah. you know, it's been a great way of learning new dishes from various people. So and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon, even though, we, you know, people will want to get out and go and eat it. They're still going to be mm, what's so and so cooking today or what tidbit do they have that I can try at home? Because I mean, if you encourage people to cook at home, you know, under the same kind of beautiful style that has inspired you from a chef or a restaurant, why not? You know, you're not going to eat out every day, so but you can still eat well at home. Bingo, bingo. So the incentive. I do hope that we are, you know, kind of veiling back <laughs> this pandemic. And of course, the more people that do get vaccinated and the more people that just continue not to have the big group parties. We've had that here. We've just recently had somebody who had a court date and got fined considerably um, because he had God knows how many people in his tiny apartment gambling and partying. And <clears throat> and that's all very well. You want the fun. But, you know, so many people, I think 200 people in this tiny apartment, you know, it's just a COVID invite. And, and unfortunately, their activities ends up shutting everybody else down. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, let's let's all be a little mindful, folks, you know, of, um, and be accountable for our own actions because we don't want to keep spreading this. And the variant, obviously, is much more aggressive right now. We do want to go back to restaurants and eat. We do want to be with our friends or our family at the table of good food and a good restaurant because that's, you know, one of the treats in life. It's the comforts of life. And the more that we kind of do our part, the quicker we're going to get back there. But <clears throat> even when we do get back there, though, as you said, there's the the um, the struggle of getting back to a place of just where you're balancing again, because right now it's a big seesaw, isn't it? And you just want to get back to an equilibrium where, you know, now from this point, you can grow again. But that's still going to take a long while for everyone to get back to that. Certainly is. It certainly is. But that's what I talk about with the element of accountability, public accountability. I, I firmly believe that opening things actually decreases the risk of cases spreading. I agree because you're monetized. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're, 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 everything is under scruple. And if you're found not following those protocols and you're shut down and you don't want to be shut down, if you've got clientele there, so the incentive to follow all these procedures is extremely high, higher than it is in stores or mm -hmm. department stores or anywhere else. I think the restaurant business is extremely safe to go to. So I do hope that everything starts opening up soon. Um, but how do people get to supporting this fund? Where can they go? Um, go to the website, which is the number eight, six struggle.com. Uh, that's, that's the best way. And then you can link from there into the GoFundMe, or you can see the stories, et cetera. And, you know, as I said, whether the people are out of work right now or not, you know, it's, um, they've still got a backlog. And even when they do go back to work, it's not going to probably be full time because you're probably not going to be fully open. You know, everything is going to have a gradual entry back into life. And so the keep on the, keep the fun going. Because as you said, somebody gets sick, they can't afford to pay for it. They, or they get sick and they go, aren't getting paid at home, you know, paid to stay home. Um, and then they, they try and get better too quickly. I've done it myself, you know, never had health coverage when I was in the restaurant business. And you go back to work too soon and uh, you kind of become sicker because of it or you make other people sick. So if we can help people stay home, get better, come back fully vitalized, you know, that's worth it. So this funding can just keep on carrying on, which I think is wonderful. And we need to get some um, some of those um, industries, uh, food industries that are on TV backing it um, and being more supportive there. What's your site, Love? And also how do people get hold of you? You know, give us your Facebook and your Twitter too. Yep, yep. So my website's www.chefgruel.com. Uh, Chefgruel.com. That's gruel like the porridge. It was a calling. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Chef Gruel, on Instagram at Andrew Gruel, uh, and you can find the restaurants at Slapfish on pretty much every social account. At Slapfish. Yeah. Um, and thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for bringing this attention to this because it's it is so desperately needed. You know, being in the restaurant business, I know how hard it is. It's a dedication. It's a passion. It's a commitment. But it is unstable. <clears throat> at the best of times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really need to support those workers right now because 
We all want to get back to the table. We all want to have those servers healthy and happy, you know, working again. And don't forget to tip well. Don't forget to order three courses. Uh, and don't forget to show your gratitude and, you know, bring your friends along and, you know, just sit around that table and appreciation that this is something you can do again. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Until next time, folks. Bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. You will hear many, many shows here at selfdiscoverymedia.com. We have new shows for you out every week. Just find them on our podcast or, or what's new. If you feel that you have something to share that makes a difference in the lives of others, or you too feel that you could be a host, please contact me at info at selfdiscoverymedia.com and we will be glad to speak with you. Have a wonderful day.